friends, welcome. Today I want to talk about the power of sharing art, and to do that I want to talk about the Great Library of Alexandria. That's right, the Great Library of Alexandria. The Great Library of Alexandria was located in Alexandria, Egypt, and I say was because it was. It is believed to have been burnt down in the year 48 BC. It stood for almost 700 years. It was a research center regarded as uh, the first model of a university, regarded as the world's first medical school, and it had shelves full of papyrus scrolls with untold knowledge, probably how to steep your coffee properly, or how to time travel. But we don't know. Estimates say that 400,000 to a million scrolls were lost. And these were texts that were collected from all over the world at the time. Many legendary scientists and mathematicians studied there. One of them was Euclid, which we will talk more about later. He is known as the father of geometry. I'd like to be known as the father of anything. Uh, some people say that the burning may have set back societal innovation by a thousand years. So this would be like if the internet burnt down today. No more PewDiePie. But I actually don't want to talk about the Library of Alexandria, the thing, I want to talk about this particular artistic rendering of the Library of Alexandria. This rendering was created by Otto von Corven, who lived from 1812 to 1886, and I'm interested in this because this artistic rendering is an example of a collaboration between documentation and the visual arts. This gives our mind food so that we can build out the world we are seeing and explore our curiosity. We can imagine what's around the corner. It sticks in our head a little bit more than maybe the Wikipedia page for the Library of Alexandria sticks in our head. Now I want to speak to the value of documentation. Documentation is fantastic. It's important for our development as people. It preserves the lessons of the past so we don't make mistakes in the future. It helps us uh, not fall into the pitfalls of, of history and redo massacres, all sorts of horrible things we'd like to avoid. But pure documentation won't paint a picture for our imagination like a beautiful photo will, for example. And this is why video and photo journalism is so incredibly important. It's such an interesting interface between documentation and artistic expression. For example, the photojournalistic work of Robert Kappa during the Normandy invasion. This is this is important that we are able to see what it what it looked and felt like that day. By the way, you are not a badass until your cause of death is stepping on a landmine. That is the standard. Uh, the work of James Noctway, his brutal photojournalistic work of conflict and suffering. It's important that we have videos and photos of Auschwitz so we know what that suffering was like. We can experience it. We can feel it. We can, we can engage with it on a, on a, a deep level that breaks our hearts. Uh, it's important that we have documentation of Genghis Khan, for example, who killed 40 million people, and it's good to know that that was also 10% of the world's population at the time. It's also probably good to know that Genghis Khan ranks first for male with the most children in history at 1,000 to 2,000. I'm sure that's helpful. It's also important to preserve history's most hectic mustaches. Wow, that's intense. So now I want to lean away from documentation and lean more into creative visual art and creative writing. Art is so incredible to me because it has the ability to influence emotions and create empathy in a way that somebody telling you what you should think or believe does not. Art has a fundamentally disarming nature to it. It is powerful in its subtlety. Legendary artists speak to the influence of art in their lives and how it redirected the path of the river of their lives to where they are now. And you can't help but think, what if they never experienced that art, right? I think a good example of this, and specifically a good example of the power of the creative group effort, 
And I want to distinguish this be, be, uh, between this and the power of the individual, which I'll get to in a second. The creative group effort is illustrated in a, an interview that I watched with Haley Williams, the legendary, dare I say, front woman of Paramore. She speaks to how uh, she speaks to some movies that influenced her. Later on in the interview, she also had some interesting thoughts about how art resonated with her uniquely when she was younger. I had seen, you know, I would see movies like uh, The Temptations or even like even Spice World. And I just thought well, they're all having fun with their friends making music. And it's like it's their thing. It's their job. And I wanted that. You know, I, I wanted to feel like, uh, you know, I wanted that us against the world kind of thing, which is just sort of inherently part of starting a band. You just kind of have this. It's like this very innocent gang mentality. And we, you know, we started that way. And then the next thing we knew, we were in a van on the road. So were you writing music or were you like aspiring singer? Like you were, I don't know, in your church or you're like singing on the street corner, or like always in the shower. What, how did it get started? Well, I did sing in church, but I was really shy as a kid. Um, my parents separated pretty early on and I was an only child um, for a while until my dad um, in his second marriage had my sisters and um, I just I just loved music I really I I had this belief that I could do it but I needed to get past like I I, I didn't really feel like proving it to anyone I just kind of knew that it, it it could happen so I sang in church a few times I had a friend that I would sing with um, for ran, you know whatever random talent shows there there were if I got up the courage to do it but it really wasn't until I started writing songs and I think writing gave me, I just realized I had a voice and I had my own mind because it, it's one thing to mimic your favorite singers and sing along in the car, but it's another thing to have your own voice. Yeah. What do you think it is about music that either heals us or it resonates with us? I mean, it sounds like you went through a really hard time with your parents' divorce. Um, and did music help you through some of that? Yeah. I mean, being a kid and, you know, having your parents split up isn't all that unique, but it's it's still heavy, you know. And um, I think for me, I always loved sad songs, and I didn't know why. But I, I think I really picked up on a lot of the the heartache that was going on in my family, and I didn't know how to say it myself. I mean, I was like six, you know. But all these other songs did, and so those were the ones that I really those were the ones that resonated with me um, from an early age, and. Um, you know, when I did start writing lyrics, there was a lot of really sad stuff and it was a lot of um, injustice, you know, and there was some angst, a lot of angst and, and early paramour. But, um, you know, that, you know, I think it's healing because it's this space that you have. I mean, I think if you're a writer, then you know it, it's that moment that you have to yourself to, to really think through how you feel about something and it's it's uninterrupted. You know, it's it's your own moment with those feelings to, to make peace with them. So yes, the value of the collective, everyone bearing the weight together to achieve a big goal is valuable. But of course, we cannot underestimate the value of the individual. I think this is particularly important because I'm speaking to you, probably an individual. I don't think I'm speaking to a lecture hall today. If so, Thank you, everyone. It's an honor. The bread in the back was supposed to be gluten-free, so I'm a little bit livid about that. But otherwise, you guys have great smiles. I want to go back into the world of Euclid, the father of geometry, a title we are all jealous of. Imagine if he never pursued his fascination. I'm sure that he had some, or well, we'll imagine, because I don't, I'm not sure, I haven't studied him enough. We're going to imagine that he had an Aunt Susie. They were in a wheat field one day. She said, hey, Euclid, I noticed that you, you're always looking at the building over there and you seem to be doing, you're just looking at angles and stuff. Why don't you go after that? And Euclid says, Aunt Susie, I don't know if Pa will support it. He wants me to be a, a lawyer, but I don't want to be a lawyer. I don't know if it'll make me happy. Aunt Susie says, Listen to me, Euclid, you weirdo with your strange name. Pa will never be satisfied no matter what you do. You'll never make him happy. Trust me, I know. Go pursue your, your angles and turn that into something. Do, do something with that. 
make a name for it because I don't, I don't think there's like a, a term for what you want to do yet. So come up with that. Geometry, good one. Go run with that. You can become the father of geometry. And he said, maybe I can. And then he went after that and then he became the father of geometry. So with that said, power in the lives of a few is power indeed. And I think that we get caught up in a numbers race and in a whip race. Death, death, <laughs> death is incredibly important. This pursuit, this is something that I think we neglect as creators. Creating depth with a single individual, a relationship with them, and a, an influence on them. Focusing on one person, engaging with one person at a time, and then applying that to everybody that you're going to speak to. Like, I want growth. I like the idea of growing and reaching more people. But I know that I have to continue to look at it as if I'm trying to influence one person at a time. Or, let me put it this way, that I'm trying to create an impact in a single person and then apply that same impact, copy and paste that same impact to everybody who will come and watch. I think we can't underestimate the power of influencing one person. And we can't underestimate the power of the mundane parts of life, the parts that feel insignificant, the interactions. We, we really... We really like big ideas, but the small ideas are important. I think a good example of this is there is a, a short documentary series by the creator Sarah Dedici, and I would encourage you to check her out if you haven't already heard of her. She's a fantastically talented creator. She has a, a documentary series called Creative Spaces TV, and she covered a company called Thousand Helmets, and the girl who runs it, her name is Gloria she speaks in this short documentary about how she was influenced by two different people in very particular ways. Listen for that. A year and a half or two years ago, I was really trying to figure out what I wanted to do in my life next. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to graduate school. It, like, I really don't know what I wanna do and it seems like the next best step. I went through the whole process. In my essays, I had written about how I really wanted to become an entrepreneur. I really wanted to go to the business school so I could be an entrepreneur. I'd really killed myself prepping for these business school apps for like six to seven months. And then the week they were due, I was about to submit them and my mom was like, wait, don't submit the apps. I really don't think you wanna go to business school. I really thought about it and a day or two before applications are due, I decided not to submit. And I was on this trip for work. It was just kind of this a long emotional trip. And at the very end, someone asked me, you know, what do you really want to be doing in life? And I really thought about it and out of nowhere, I said, I want to make bicycle helmets. My name is Gloria, I live in Los Angeles, and I guess I make bike helmets for a living. What you just heard probably did not feel very extravagant at the time of the two interactions she had with these two people. But these interactions unlocked two specific things within her that may have changed the course of her life. Our interactions on a daily basis feel boring, but that doesn't mean that the effects of them are. She is creating helmets that keep people from having brain trauma, they're stylish, and, and she's probably using some of the principles that Euclid came up with. My, how everything's come full circle. Isn't the world a beautiful place? You can do this with your art as well. And if you're somebody who feels like you have a small voice, and this is me, by the way, uh, imagine you're sitting in a room with six people. These people are looking at you, and they truly care about what you have to say to them. What would you say to them? I think this is the correct thought process. I want less of the focus on width in our art, more the focus on depth, creating a deep impact with the people that we create our art for. That's it for this one. I would love to hear your thoughts. Maybe you too can become the father of something that hasn't been invented yet. Goodbye.